The lantern painted the curving sides of the well with swaying light as they descended. The earth had stopped trembling by the time they reached a granite lip at the bottom of the well, and they paused there, huddled together, to catch their breath. Sanctuaire a la grotte is saved. Bisclavre nodded mutely. Minnie just focused on breathing. Behind her eyes, the memory of the mountainside sliding down into the valley repeated again and again, the majesty and the horror of it fresh in her mind. She doubted it would ever fail to inspire a deep dread in her for all her days, however long those would be. The lantern's light shifted as Bisclavre lowered it. Beneath them, a fissure in the earth opened into deeper darkness. Another entrance to the cave system, Minnie realized. Somewhere below, she could hear water trickling. Bisclavre sniffed experimentally, the sound loud in the cramped space. All Minnie could smell was damp earth and the unpleasant, hot scent of their combined breathing. How do we get down? Carefully. Despite her newly acquired aversion to touching the creature, Minnie vividly pictured scruffing it and tossing it down into the fissure. Just to test how far it was to the bottom, of course. There's a rope. Minnie and Beast Pavre shuffled around, mindful of the gap. Coiled at their feet was a length of thick rope tied to an iron ring in the well's foundational stones. Minnie tugged at it, testing its strength. It seemed sound enough. Beast Clavery took a moment to secure the lantern to his belt before claiming the rope from her hands. You rest a minute more. I'll go down first. After a bit of maneuvering, he lowered himself through the gap. From above, Minnie watched anxiously as he descended, a light seemingly floating in an empty black void. Ten feet. Twenty. Thirty. Forty. Finally, a glass-smooth blue-green surface appeared beneath him. Water! Minnie called down, her voice much louder than she'd expected. Beast Clavery took extra care as he lowered himself in, untying the lantern first and holding it high over his head as he slipped into the still blue. The water was deep. His feet didn't meet any surface, and he bobbed with the effort to keep his head and the lantern above water, especially with his pack weighing him down. Ripples expanded across the pool, marring waters that had lain placid for God knew how long. Bisclavre looked around, spluttering <coughs> as water briefly swamped his mouth, before he began swimming. Minnie shifted, careful to keep him in sight. Fortunately, he only had to swim a few feet before he hoisted himself up out of the water and onto another stony lip. The matigo was already there, waiting for him. It turned its golden eyes up toward Minnie. She hadn't even noticed its weight shift, if she'd noticed it had any weight at all. It was her turn then. With the light far down below, she had to position herself by touch and sound, which, of course, meant she felt horribly off-balance and jittery. Not something one wanted to be when poised over a nearly 50-foot drop. The rope was rough and prickly beneath her palms as she began lowering herself down, hand by hand. She'd always hated rope exercises in the Order's accelerated training. It was worse now for the pulling ache in her cut arm. She'd have to check the dressing soon. No telling how well it had stopped the bleeding, considering, well, everything that had just happened. Her grip strength was weaker, that was certain. Which was why, halfway down, it failed and she fell. The water closed over her in a crashing clap. Bubbles sprayed from her nose and mouth, and she twisted, kicking frantically for the surface. It was further away than she thought. Her lungs burned and fought against her, and her head felt light as she struggled against the weight of her pack. The water resisted her, and in a wild moment of panic she thought it might be trying to hold her in, clutching her around her body and squeezing her tight, intent to drag her down into its darkness. But then, with one final, desperate stroke, her face broke through the water, and she surged up, spluttering and gasping. 
Deputy Soiree was calling for her. She blinked the water from her eyes and whirled toward his voice. He stood on the stone lip some fifteen feet away. The shadowed planes of his face deepened and angled sharply in the lantern light. And there, glistening on the water as it bobbed along in front of her, was a long, slender shape. It took Minnie a moment to understand what she was seeing. When she did, her stomach dropped. <sighs> My arrows! Minnie twisted in a tight circle, looking for evidence of any more. There was another one riding a ripple away from her. She grabbed the first and swam for the second. Hang that! Get over here! She reached the second and tucked both between her teeth. She couldn't see any more in the water, and damn it, she couldn't spend too long looking. The water was cold, which would soon become a problem. And there was something else about the pool that made her uneasy. Something more than its depth and chill that she couldn't quite place. Shuddering, Minnie swam over to the stone outcropping, and Beast Lave had tall her up onto its lip. Instantly, she reached behind her and began counting her arrows. Seven in her quiver, two in her mouth, one lost in the fight with the gargoyle when the madgo took over, she realized, and another to the water. Shit! She slid the arrows back into her quiver and wiped the water from her eyes. Shit! She couldn't afford to be losing arrows already, not so soon after they'd been replaced. They'd barely been used at all. It was ridiculous to lose them so quickly, and for no other reason than she'd been clumsy. A hand rested on her shoulder and stayed there for a long moment. Come on. Bisclavre helped her up. We can't stay here. He was right. She took a deep breath. There were more steps to be taken, and a journey through darkness and under stone ahead. The Matigo's eyes appeared in the black spaces to their right. This way, past the water, and be quick about it. Bisclavre picked up the lantern, opened its shutter wide, and began picking his way along the narrow lip around the water toward a cleft in the cavern wall. The cavern they found themselves in was large, with walls smooth and jagged, like a giant chisel had roughly carved it from the red stone. Minnie touched the wall to help herself balance, and it was gritty beneath her fingertips. Sandstone, eroded by groundwater. They'd fallen into an exposed pool of a larger aquifer. Five minutes later, they reached the cleft. It was so narrow that they had to squeeze through sideways, one by one, the sandstone edges catching and dragging at her pack and her sodden wool uniform. When it opened up again, they were in another chamber, only half as large as the one they'd left, and completely dry. Speaking of which... We need to wring out our clothes. Minnie pushed the wet strands of her hair back from her face. The air down here wasn't cold, but it wasn't warm either, and they were soaked and dripping. The water in their clothes would soon sap the heat from their skin. Beast Glavry nodded, set the lantern down, and began unlacing his boots. Minnie started to do the same, but stopped just as she'd bent down, and stared. Beast Glavry's woolen gray socks, soiled with mud, were still stretched over her boots. Her mind moved slowly as she tried to recall why they were even on her feet in the first place. The Matigo had insisted he give them to her before... before the first spell. If then the stranger steps upon our streets, may cobblestones reject their very souls, and wickedness shall force them to their knees. Suddenly, Minnie <laughs> laughed. The spell wasn't about a soul in the spiritual sense. It was about the souls of feet. Beast Glavry paused from dumping the water out of his boots. <laughs> They're your socks, she huffed. That's why I could walk and the Germans couldn't. Your socks tricked the magic. She pulled one from her foot. It was comically stretched beyond its original shape, and it was doubtful it would ever return to the correct size. Do you want them back? For a beat, Visclavre didn't answer. Then they both started cracking up, until their laughter was bouncing around their heads and ringing down the tunnels. There was a decidedly manic edge to the sound. <laughs> no. He pushed his wet hair out of his eyes as he caught his breath. 
You can keep them. Minnie pulled the other sock from her foot, still giggling, and wrung it out. Neither of them was terribly concerned with modesty as they continued to strip, though they did courteously turn their backs to one another. Water splashed around their feet with every twist of their sodden clothing, until there were twin rivulets running across the uneven sandstone floor away from them. As Minnie began to pull her shirt over her brassiere, she remembered to check her dressing. A red splotch was already seeping through the bandages. I can fix that. The matigo wended its way toward her, tail held high. Minnie resisted the urge to back away from it. Is that so? And what, pray tell, would be your price? It padded closer, its eyes half-lidded. The taste of your blood would be enough. Minnie recoiled then. What is it saying? That it can heal my wound. She should let it. That would be the smartest thing to do. But she couldn't bear it, the thought of that thing being close to her again, of it lapping up her blood and relishing it. Beast Clavre hesitated. We could redress it if you want. I have some clothes that would make decent bandages. I have more dressings. Minnie wasn't prepared for the wave of relief that washed her from head to toe when Beast Clavre agreed with her, instead of telling her she was being silly for rejecting the Matigo's offer. Let me find them. Minnie made sure to button up her shirtwaist and roll up her sleeve before calling for Beast Clavre. His limp was more pronounced as he shuffled over. He tossed a dark look at the Matigo, and she wondered if it hadn't spoken to him just then, too. He began unwinding the bandages. I... I have a favor to ask, my damson. Yes? The pale skin beneath the bandages was dark and bruised around the cut. Thankfully, it didn't start bleeding again immediately. She handed him some fresh wrappings. They were slightly damp, which wasn't ideal, but beggars couldn't be choosers. Might I borrow some of these bandages? Minnie had been careful not to look too closely at him, the same way he was being careful not to look at her. It was more out of respect and propriety, really, than any embarrassment. If she had been any less exhausted, the young woman in her might have been more bashful about standing right next to a half-dressed man who, just minutes ago, had been completely naked, to say nothing of her American upbringing, which was inherently puritanical. For his part, Beast Clavre didn't seem the slightest bit phased. He was an older man who had surely seen his fair share of naked women, and he was French to boot. But now Minnie surveyed him, sweeping her gaze from his wet curls down to his damp shirt and his trousers held up by suspenders. And there, peeking out from the bottom of one of his pant legs, was the white edge of a bandage. He was injured, and had been this entire time. Depending on how extensive the injury was, replacing his dressing might use up the rest of her reserves. It didn't matter. She wouldn't say no. That was a problem for later. Of course. And could I ask for your assistance? Yes. With a tug, Beast Glovery tied off the new dressing, now properly snug against her skin, and nervously stepped back. Minnie dug some more bandages out of her haversack and gestured for him to sit. Beast Glovery pulled his pant leg up, revealing a dressing that wound from his ankle to halfway up his shin. He flinched as he did so. Minnie eyed him, then set to work undoing the wrapping. I take it this wasn't really an old footballing injury then? I'm afraid not. He hissed when the air touched his wounds. Minnie hissed at the sight of them. There was a curved line of deep gouges in his skin on either side of his leg. They were half healed, but still red and raw looking. What on earth happened to you? She pulled her haversack closer and fished an ointment tin from one pocket. His only answer was a pained smile. The ointment was thick and slick on her fingers as she gently dabbed it into a divot. Beast Clavre took a sharp breath, his hands closing to pained fists. Minnie moved on, tracing the arc of the gouges, lightly sealing them with ointment. It was a strange injury, like teeth 
but no animal she knew had a mouth so wide or teeth so uniform. Her finger paused over the last mark. These were from teeth, but these savage marks were left by no animal. There it was, rising up around her again, Marie Babineau's wrecked cottage. Shattered dishes, broken furniture, scores in the wood floors, and there, under the ruined sofa, a wolf trap. Her eyes met Beast Rays, and he knew she'd connected the dots. Her muscles tightened, and she wondered if she should draw her dagger, for the person in front of her was at the very least a liar, and not strictly human either. Beast Glavre broke their staring contest and dipped his head. I'm not the beast, but but I wasn't entirely truthful in our last conversation. Minnie inhaled through her nose, studying herself. He didn't seem like an immediate threat anyway. With deliberate care, she finished dabbing the ointment into his wound and began the task of dressing it. Why don't we start with the most obvious question? What are you? He seemed about to make a joke about being a bookseller or a witch, but thought better of it. Have you ever read the Lays of Marie de France? She'd never even heard of it. It's a medieval text, 12th century, and it tells 12 tales. One of those is the tale of Beast Clavray, my ancestor, as it turns out. And what was he? A garwolf. You mean a werewolf? He shrugged, wincing as she tied off the bandages. If you like. Minnie stood. They needed to get moving again. This didn't seem like a conversation that couldn't happen while they walked. Bisclavre, following her lead, began putting on the remainder of his clothing. When the silence stretched a little too long, he cleared his throat. <clears throat> the noise grated harshly off the cavern walls. It is a rare gift. Um, we weren't cursed by a god or bitten by a creature. We were born with it. It tends to skip generations, but every once in a while, a, a child of our family develops the ability to shift between man and wolf at will, and by force during the full moon and the day preceding and following it. Minnie finished buttoning up her uniform coat and reached for the rest of her kit. Can you remember it, your time as a wolf? Yes. Good. She buckled her quiver across her chest and slipped her leather bracer over her forearm. Then you can tell me exactly what happened at Marie Babineau's. The lantern light slid across the red sandstone walls, so strangely shaped by water and time. Here it dipped, scooped smooth, and there it jutted out in large, uneven serrations, like the edge of a giant's knife buried in the earth. The matigo trotted ahead of them, weaving through the undulating stone passageway, teasing the boundary between the lantern's light and the true darkness of the earth, and occasionally dissolving into the latter. Minnie listened to what Beast Clavre had to say. He insisted that what he said about his objection to the whole affair was true. But I owed my... His frown was deep and weary. I did not know about my heritage when I first transformed. The last Garwolf in my branch of the family was many generations back, and I knew nothing about him or his gift, nor did my parents. I found the Lay of Beast Clavre myself, but it is only a story. It helped a little, but not enough. Marie encountered me one full moon and approached me a few days later. She was curious, not afraid, and I was very afraid of myself back then. But she changed that. She went so far as to help me track down and reconnect with a distant cousin, also a garwolf, in Scotland. It was around that time that I developed an interest in magic. He smiled ruefully at the memory. She obliged me, and I became a coven member. The smile faded. When the war broke out, I knew I had to get my family to safety, but I didn't have enough money for us all to go. I sent them to Brittany and promised I'd follow when I had the means. But business has not been good. And anyway, Covens have rules. Minnie looked over at him. Babana wouldn't release you? Please, Clavry sighed. 
She said she would, that she'd lend me the money I needed too, but only if I helped her and Colette first. She used your family against you. Beast Glavre stepped around, a jagged outcropping. She was worried for Sanctuaire, and for France, as I said. Desperate, even. Desperate enough to call in all of the favors I owed her. That didn't make it right, Minnie thought. Would Would you you think think the same thing thing if their their gamble had succeeded? succeeded? Minnie startled. The Matigo was padding alongside her. If they had forged a weapon that turned the tides of war, would you think them evil? Or would his temporary sacrifice become an amusing anecdote, his thrilling contribution to a big chapter in the history of this age that he could tell to his fat and happy grandchildren by the fireside? She wanted to say that she would, but she wasn't sure. Hindsight made everything seem clear and judgments easy to hand out, but that was an illusion. Hindsight equipped all people with a seductive, comforting lie. That they would have known better. That they would have never allowed harm to pass unchallenged. That they would have done the heroic deed. But they couldn't know. Would never know if they really would have. And that was the trick of it, wasn't it? She shook her head. That was something to ponder further another time. Why did you tell me Colette had brought a wolf? None of the other coven members threw in that little detail. Beast Glavre's eyebrows rose. I did not know that. We... we didn't talk much after what happened. I did not think they would turn me over, but I assumed they would have mentioned that a wolf was present. It would make sense magically, and it would explain the wolf trap in Marie's cottage. Minnie nodded. Now for the real question. What happened that night, Beast Glavre? It took him a minute to gather his thoughts. His voice shook when he spoke. Marie and Colette, they... They thought they could raise the spirit of the beast and bind it to Colette. But they wanted to make it so she could transform between the two. They thought if they tapped into my essence, used my inborn ability as a pattern for their spell, Colette would retain her sense of self and control the change. Control the beast. He scoffed and swiped a tear from his cheek. Lunacy. It was doomed from the start. I've thought about what went wrong, and I think I know. Colette and Marie wanted to use the pull of the full moon to strengthen their work. It was the best time to call upon the spirit of the beast, too, but the full moon is when I cannot choose to be a man or a wolf. I must be a wolf, and I must stay a wolf. So, when the beast's substance was grafted onto the metaphysical frame of my gift and Colette's physical body, it became a curse. She became the beast. Marie had put down traps in case something went wrong. In the madness, I got caught in one. Marie's last act was to free me from its teeth. She saved my life. He met Minnie's eyes and mustered a sad smile. That is why I could not scry the beast for you. Our essences are related, and my very presence would confuse any spell. Minnie walked alongside him in silence, turning his account over. Technically, she should take him into an order station, there to be questioned by the scribes about his involvement in this whole affair, one that had resulted in the deaths of dozens of people at this point. She dismissed the notion quickly. Her mission to stop the beast was her priority, and if Beast Glavre was to be believed, and she did believe him, his participation had been coerced. The culpability for the resulting crimes fell squarely on Marie and Colette's shoulders. I'm afraid I lied about my buying trip, too. I was selling anything I could in Epinal. I finally have the money to go to my family. I only came back to close down the shop and pack. Then you came, and then the Germans. I'm sorry. Beast Glavre gestured to their passage through the earth. I suppose it's not so bad. I'm still on my way, aren't I? We did make it. Thank you, by the way. I don't know if I'd have made it out of Sanctuaire à la Grotte without your help. And, and mine. mine. 
Well, I wouldn't have had yours if I hadn't had his, would I? Beast Clavre chuckled half-heartedly. <laughs> Don't thank me for that. You may wish I had not summoned it by tomorrow. They paused their conversation to climb up an incline that led to a tight tunnel. After crawling on hands and knees for fifty feet, they came to a tall enough crevice to stand again. Is that where you'll go once we get out of here? To your family? Yes. Beast Clavre <sighs> sighed, smiling. They're expecting me. And in her last letter, my wife told me, well, she told me our eldest daughter is showing signs that she's a garwolf too. Your wife knows? Of course. I would not have it any other way. She's my heart and my hearth, my wife. She's as strong as she is smart and compassionate. But she cannot teach Amelie about being a garwolf. I can. And for the first time in God knows how many generations, she can have the benefit of learning from another of her kind what it means to be a garwolf. She will not be alone, as I was. Minnie hesitated before she asked her next question, but she supposed they had nothing better to talk about, and talking helped distract her from the increasing feeling of unease being underground was stirring in her. What's it like becoming a wolf? Bisclavry pondered the question. It is... Something that cannot be described. It is simply magical. I have done magic as a magician, of course, but doing it does not compare to feeling it, to being it. It was a disappointing answer, but Minnie didn't mind so much, because the way he said it, the conviction and the reverence his voice held, made her feel as though she had heard an echo of what it must be like. To her relief, it sounded nothing like her experience with the Madigo. Of course, it is rather obnoxious having to hide my clothes all over the mountains. Minnie turned to look at him and almost tripped. Pardon? He laughed. Oh, I didn't explain. After I change into a wolf, I can't change back unless I have my clothing. Don't ask me why, I couldn't tell you. That's just how the magic works. So I have to hide my clothes all over the woods and the mountain. That way, if I wander far from where I transformed, I could still change back at my nearest stash. The lay of Beast Clavre taught me the importance of planning ahead in that regard. Minnie huffed out a laugh of her own. The Order of Catherine made magic sound logical and quantifiable, as though it obeyed its own particularly peculiar laws of physics. But the more Minnie learned about it in her travels, the more she realized just how bizarre, miraculous, and ultimately unpredictable magic truly was. She was about to ask another question when the texture of the stone beneath her feet changed. Confused, she stepped back. Beast Clavre raised the lantern higher. Their tunnel suddenly ended and picked up again at a new rock layer, transforming from the smooth red of sandstone to the grainy, pepper-flecked gray of granite. The serpentine, sinuous curves of their current path abruptly hardened and narrowed. The water of millennia passed, finding it harder to cut a broad swath through the much more resilient metamorphic stone. We We have have come come a long long way, way, and we have have longer to go. The Madigo stood behind them, staring into the granite passageway with singular focus. Something about that made the hairs on Minnie's neck stand up, and she had the sudden, disturbing thought that it didn't want to go in there. The tip of its tail twitched, and its eyes slid to hers. Come. From here we must be swift and silent as shadows. Stay close, dear Minerva, and whatever you do, stay quiet. Stay quiet.